fire department as it exists today doesn't really have a long history. Our, our brothers in, in the Bryan Fire Department uh, have had a, a department for about 125 years. The actual College Station Fire Department uh, didn't really begin till uh, 1971. Uh, I'll tell you some of the history before that, though, uh, as we get it up. Uh, it's a uh, really, really a little, little different kind of uh, uh, situation than, than a lot of communities are faced with. Uh, as you probably know, in 1877, the post office uh, uh, gave the area the name College Station, uh, even though there wasn't a College Station, uh, City of College Station. Uh, but there was a, a quite a, a community building up around the uh, first public university in the state, Texas A&M, at that time, A&M College of Texas. Uh, at this point, the fire protection was provided by uh, students on campus, typically uh, Milner Hall students. And very little training, very little equipment. Uh, but all the want to in the world to, to provide this service for, uh, at that time, the college and the surrounding area. It said very little uh, limited training and equipment, and it really hampered the efforts of, of the <coughs> students to, to try to uh, help control uh, fires on campus and in the surrounding area. Uh, there were several very uh, destructive and costly fires on the campus and in the community that really emphasized to, to everybody uh, dealing with the, the university in the area around it that there was need for, for better training and, and better equipment for fire service. This picture is the uh, old main building on campus. It was about 65 years old when it burned in 1912. Just prior to that, uh, there was a fire that uh, burned the old mess hall on campus and, and of course that was a major problem uh, being the mess hall. Uh, and then shortly uh, in 1920 uh, the mechanical engineering shops for the, the college uh, suffered a fire and were completely destroyed. Uh, these events uh, really pointed to the need for, for better organized fire protection. Uh, not only for the university property, but also extending out to the, to the community that was, that was still growing up around the university. Uh, so the state legislature uh, authorized A&M College to begin a fireman's training school. And I'm sure you all are all familiar with the facility uh, that's out there by Easterwood Airport now. That is uh, one of the largest fire and emergency service training facilities in the entire world. Uh, very busy place, uh, they train uh, typically between 40 and 45,000 students uh, from all over the world out there each year, not only in fire protection, but hazardous materials response and urban search and rescue. Uh, if you've never been out there and seen the fire field or disaster city where the, where the uh, urban search and rescue training is conducted, it's really worth a, a trip out there to, to see that facility. It's really one of a kind. But the uh, first fire training school was, was a short course uh, uh, basically a weekend kind of course, it occurred in 1930, and it was attended uh, by less than 200 firefighters. Uh, the second fireman's training school the next year in April uh, was taught by the chemistry department on campus, and the uh, enrollment actually went up to over 300. Uh, the the uh, uh, individual who directed the training at that point in time uh, was Dr. H.R. Brayton, who was head of the chemistry department. And the actual fire field facility out there is still known as Brayton <coughs> Fire Field. Uh, it's still part of the, uh, uh, used to be the uh, Fire Protection Training Division, but now it's ESTE, the Emergency Services Training Institute. But the actual fire training uh, facility is still known as Brayton Field. Because the, the first two uh, fire schools were such a success, uh, the legislature authorized the university to conduct these classes annually and they've been going on uh, ever since. Uh, typically the, the enrollment now, well, it's more than just a, a fire training school now, it's about a, a four week uh, situation now. There's a Spanish speaking school uh, that's a week long, there's a, an industrial firefighting school, 
Uh, there's municipal firefighting school. Typically, the municipal school uh, services about 2,000 students each year. Uh, there had been times when there was uh, twice that many students out there, but with the economy uh, fluctuating, uh, the, the coming up with the budget to send people to, to classes is, is harder than it used to be. But uh, we're seeing a steady rise in the number of people who are attending the school every year. And it's really uh, quite a bit. Uh, it's a picture of the 13th annual school uh, uh, for firemen at Texas A&M. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry it's not a, a little clearer. It's, it's a scan of a copy of a copy of an original. Uh, so it, it kind of kind of suffered over time. Uh, but uh, uh, great looking bunch of films. Really excited. This uh, is also a scan of a copy of a scan of an original. But this was the uh, first what we call modern fire apparatus uh, to arrive at Texas A&M. Uh, it was actually a demonstration model that the university purchased. Uh, by modern fire apparatus, we mean motorized. You can actually get in and crank it up and drive it where it needs to go. Uh, before that, uh, uh, the, the pumper, the steamer, uh, was usually uh, either pulled by people or by horses. So this was the, the first one that was actually uh, an automotive fire apparatus. Uh, in 1931, the, the battalion announced tentative plans calling for new equipment to be under the care of the college, giving it adequate firefighting equipment. Uh, several more major fires on campus and in the surrounding community occurred before the delivery of the, the newly funded uh, apparatus. Delays of almost a year caused the battalion to publish a series of very critical editorials calling for quicker action uh, on the delivery of the fire apparatus. And on June 21st, 1932, the first of three fire trucks arrived at A&M. Uh, the first truck was 1928 Mac, uh, a, a triple combination puffer. It was called triple combination, and that's a term we still use in the fire service today because it had a, had a mechanical pump, it could pump water, it had hose so it could deliver the water from the pump, and it had uh, ground ladders that allowed access of upper floors. So, so that's where that triple combination comes in. Uh, it carried 750 gallons of water. Uh, this engine is known as, as Old Mac, and it's actually been restored and is out at uh, Brayton Field in the Henry Smith Building. Uh, so that, that apparatus is, is still out there. Uh, another pumper and a ladder truck were scheduled for delivery in July of 1932. The arrival of the new fire trucks uh, brought excitement and high expectations to the volunteers that were charged with uh, fire protection uh, for the university and the surrounding community. Uh, this is a picture of Fireman's Hill. Many of you probably remember the traffic circle. You're familiar with that, but that's uh, University Drive and College Avenue. This is the what's the northeast corner. Uh, typically, we call that married student housing, but that's all going away. That's going to be developed pretty soon into Campus Point. Uh, but uh, trained primarily A&M physical plant employees uh, as volunteers and students, A&M organized the Texas A&M College Fire Department uh, after it received the, these, these uh, new apparatus. Once properly trained and qualified in fire suppression, Employees became eligible for college furnished housing. Uh, in, uh, lost my place. Uh, furnished by the university, the housing provided was situated in uh, this neighborhood and it became known as Fireman's Hill. Uh, the firemen were notified uh, uh, of an emergency uh, by party line phone. Some of us remember party lines? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, that was the, the first, I guess you could say, formally organized uh, fire protection for the university and the surrounding area. Rapid growth and development of A&M College and the surrounding community during the early 30s created many public concerns and issues. Uh, community fire safety and the enforcement of building codes, electrical codes, and equipment installation were among the concerns that only a local government could address. Uh, there were also infrastructure concerns, uh, water supply, uh, dealing with, with uh, wastewater, uh, streets, and all that kind of stuff. So, so in 1938, all these concerns persuaded the residents to incorporate their community into the city of College Station. And as we know, that was 
just about 75 years ago. I, just, I see some 75 year pins out there. Uh, after the incorporation, uh, the AM Board of Directors authorized College Station to purchase for an annual fee the service of the Texas AM College Fire Department to provide fire protection to the newly incorporated city. <coughs> Uh, the agreement provided residents with affordable fire protection and code enforcement. As city officials continued developing public, service, public services during the 1940s and 50s, fire protection services continued to be purchased from A&M College Fire Department. <coughs> Paying insurance fees for personnel and equipment, salaries and, and uh, charges incurred during responses, uh, plus tuition for one firefighter to attend the fireman's training school each summer, uh, was a cost-effective arrangement for the city at that point in time. Uh, this is an example of a budget. This is from 1956. And you can see the total proposed budget for that fiscal year was uh, $6,700. Uh, they came in uh, under that. I was really impressed with that, $66,15,84. Uh, we, as stewards of public funds, really try our best to stay within budget. And I'm really impressed with that. Uh, our current budget is slightly more than that, but uh, there again, the, the level of services provided has changed a bit over the years. Uh, the 60s led to increased population in College Station and an unexpected demand for expanded city services. Uh, the need for increased services motivated city leaders to explore alternatives to finance several long-awaited capital improvement projects uh, within the growing community. In 1966, there was a special bond election to overhaul the water system. Uh, this was actually approved and completed in about two years, also under budget, which I'm really impressed with. Uh, they, uh, at that point, they uh, installed some uh, above ground water storage tank, uh, tanks, an elevated water storage tank, and uh, either rehabbed or installed uh, 13 miles of new uh, water system piping throughout the city. Uh, this was sorely needed at that point in time and uh, was really a tremendous uh, asset investment and in inf infrastructure for the city. Uh, in 1967, there was another special bond election uh, allowed for the 1969 groundbreaking ceremony of a much needed city hall complex in combination fire and police station with equipment to start a full-time city fire department. Uh, this city hall is still in use today uh, City Hall, 1101 Texas Avenue, across from the golf course, uh, and the building just south of that, uh, uh, 1207 uh, Texas Avenue, was the original uh, combination police and fire department. Uh, and, and believe me, having you know, firefighters and police officers operating out of the same facility uh, led to some interesting times. <laughs> uh, in 1968, the council awarded a bid to the uh, uh, for the first uh, trucks uh, for the City College Station Fire Department, the Houston Fire Equipment Company. This is for two custom white American La France 750 triple combination pumpers, triple combination pump, carried water, had ground ladders, had hose. Uh, delivery was, was expected in July of 1970. In January of 1970, the uh, City College Station became one of the first cities in Texas to implement the use of the 911 emergency call system. You may not have known that. Uh, there was, uh, at the time, College Station started their 911 system. There was only one other city in the state using 911, and now it's universal. It's all over the place. Uh, the first city council meeting in the new city hall happened on March 9th, 1970, and dedication ceremonies for the city hall and the fire and police building were held on March 21st, 1970. Uh, city and university officials wanted to gradually transfer the responsibility for fire protection from what was now the AM University uh, Fire Department to the city. That involved uh, working out a rather uh, complex and comprehensive <coughs> mutual aid agreement between uh, the university to share their resources and for the, the city to, to reciprocate with shared resources. Uh, significant, the, the uh, big event that started the fire department uh, was when the uh, city hired uh, Woody Sevenson as the first fire chief for the College Station Fire Department. Uh, he had previously been the fire marshal 
uh, for Texas A&M University. In July 1970, the first full-time paid firefighter for the city of College Station was hired. And this was basically a, a uh, theoretically, a 40-hour-a-week job, eight to five, uh, take care of the trucks, maintenance, that kind of stuff, and uh, uh, drive one of those, those new engines uh, to the fire, still depending on, on personnel from the university uh, department. Uh, there was also an on-call component. Uh, somebody's got to be ready 24 hours a day, so that was also part of it. Uh, and then 71 uh, was the completion of the comprehensive mutual aid agreement between the city and the university. Uh, stated that no more than 50% of the College Station Fire Department would be comprised of Texas A&M volunteer firefighters. College Station would have access to uh, A&M's equipment. College Station would provide protective clothing for the, for the volunteers. And the College Station Fire Department would assume responsibility for fire protection on the Texas A&M campus. Uh, this is a service that the fire department still provides today. It's the only city department that provides direct service to the university. Uh, the university has all their other stuff, power, water, uh, police, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we're the only department, only city department that provides direct service to the university. And while the city and A&M worked to finalize a mutual aid agreement, uh, the Texas A&M University Fire Department still uh, continued to respond to calls within uh, the city college station. Uh, once this agreement was in effect, it reversed a 33-year-old tradition of, of the university providing fire protection services to the city of College Station. In late 1972 and 73, uh, fire department staffing increased to six full-time on-duty firefighters, manning three 24-hour on, 48-hour off shifts. So there were two firefighters on duty in the station 24 hours a day. Uh, uh, for, and this really started in, in early 1973 when staffing was put online. Uh, this is a shift scheme we continue today. Our, our shift personnel are on duty for 24 hours and then they're off for 48 hours. So we run, run three shifts and uh, staff six stations 24 hours a day. Uh, supplemented by additional manpower requirements for the uh, 12 to 15 volunteers who had uh, formerly been with the University Fire Department, and they were worked as paid on-call firefighters. They attended drills, uh, they attended meetings. Whenever they were called out, they were paid uh, a, a stipend per call. Uh, back then, I think it started out at about $3, which is pretty cost-effective. In May of 1974, uh, personnel increased from six to 11 full-time firefighters still supplementing manpower at that point with 17 paid call firefighters. Uh, manpower had expanded to include uh, 17 full-time firefighters by 1975. And during this time period, the department established the Fire Prevention Division. Uh, the division was responsible for arson investigation, public education, uh, inspections, and code enforcement. Uh, the division had grown from a staff of one to a staff of five. Uh, responsibilities have grown to include uh, existing and new construction inspection, uh, new construction uh, 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 plans review, uh, fire suppression system inspections and testing, and public fire education. Prior to the spring of 1977, emergency medical service was provided uh, to the city and the community by private ambulance companies. These usually worked under contract to uh, the county government. Uh, in the first week of March, one of the ambulance services announced it would cease operations by March 8th and leave two community purchase uh, box type ambulances with the College Station Fire Department. Now this resulted in uh, perhaps the single most influential and significant development in the history of the College Station Fire Department. Uh, that's when we began providing uh, ambulance service for the city of College Station and the southern half of Brazos County, a service that we still provide today. Uh, at that point in time, uh, the College Station Fire Department had uh, two ambulances and one EMT. You can see the staffing problems that we had. Uh, for a while, we were, were supplemented uh, by contract with, with private ambulance services till we could train up personnel and get them in place to, to staff the ambulances. Uh, 
Uh, in 1980, uh, the fire department expanded its facilities by opening uh, Station 2. Uh, Station 2 is at Rio Grande and uh, Harvey Mitchell Parkway. Uh, station is staffed, uh, at that time, was staffed by six firefighter EMTs and housed one fire engine and an ambulance. Uh, station 2 was, was remodeled uh, several years ago. Uh, this is what the facility looks like now. Uh, staffing there is uh, uh, currently is an engine company, an ambulance, and a ladder company. Uh, some of our special operations equipment is still in, in Station 2. And in uh, 1984, the fire department acquired its first ladder truck, a Pierce Arrow truck with a 100-foot elevated platform. This unit was required in order to meet fire protection needs for uh, uh, the, the number of multi-story buildings that were going up on campus and in the city. The department's emergency medical service was also upgraded this year, that year from what was basic life support, what we used to call load and go, uh, to advanced life support, where we started uh, uh, being able to do advanced life-saving techniques. Uh, we started carrying drugs, IVs. So in mid-85, we added a 4,000 square foot expansion which added some administrative offices and a, an extra base space for, for an ambulance. In 1994, uh, CSFD had their first Kid Safe Fire Safety Program. We had 54 youngsters go through it. Kid Safe was a very, very effective program for many, many years. Unfortunately, it's not something that's currently funded. Uh, and, and the 80s and 90s, it was easier to get time in the schools to go in and talk to the kids, especially for a program as extensive as the Kids Safe program. Uh, so much of the school day now is, is things that have to be done by the school system. It, it's harder and harder for us uh, to, to intrude uh, on their time to, to, to talk with the kids and teach the kids. Uh, they are still very helpful during uh, Nationally, it's Fire Prevention Week, but for us, it's Fire Prevention Month. We have so many elementary schools now, uh, it takes us about a month to, to be able to, to go through all of them during that time of the year. Uh, but unfortunately, the Kids Safe program is one of those programs that uh, we, can, we can no longer do. In, in 94, two, also two new positions, a public education officer and a fire protection specialist were added to the Fire Prevention Division. Uh, funding was approved for a third fire station with groundbreaking ceremonies. Uh, in early spring, a uh, course completion agreement uh, was also signed with Scott and Glenn College that would allow their EMS students who were taking uh, EMT basic, intermediate, and paramedic classes uh, to ride out on, on our ambulances to get those, those required hours that they needed uh, uh, riding out. The original Station 3 uh, was built on, on uh, Highway 6 South. It's now the 4-H building. That location was chosen because at, at that point, even though uh, there was uh, uh, incorporated city land on the east side and the west side of Highway 6, nobody was sure where the, where the development was going to happen first, uh, where the development was really going to take off. So, so that station location for Station 3 was kind of on the 50-yard line. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a bad choice to, to do that at that point. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but the, the access roads, the feeder roads, were two-way. Mm -hmm. So we could come out of that station, turn left or right, it, it was okay. We knew at some point uh, development was going to take off on the east or on the west or on both, which it has done, and that the, the uh, feeder roads were going to go one way, which would cause response problems. But at that point, uh, that was a pretty good location for Station 3. In 1995, uh, College Station and Bryan Fire Departments agreed to begin an automatic aid agreement. Now what that means is the closest appropriate unit responds to a call regardless of where the call is or where the unit is from. So that's why you see some red engines in College Station. Uh, Bryan sees some, some white engines at some locations and there's no telling what color ambulance you're going to see because that's, that's a busy part of, the, of, of our business is, is EMS. So this automatic aid agreement met the meant that both the citizens of Bryan or College Station would get appropriate help as quickly as possible, regardless of the location. Uh, this automatic aid agreement is, is still in effect today, and we use it daily. Uh, the department also purchased uh, what they call AEDs, automatic uh, external defibrillators, 
uh, for all the fire engines beginning the advanced life support crew concept. Uh, you may not know it, but all of our fire apparatus can do everything an ambulance can do except transport somebody to the hospital. We have paramedics on the, the engines and the ladder truck. Uh, we carry all the medical supplies, drugs, IV fluids, everything that the ambulances do except for uh, having the transport capabilities. Uh, this is to, to ensure that uh, advanced life support gets where it's needed as quickly as possible. Also, the Hazardous Materials Response Program received a $3,000 donation from Union Pacific Resources to purchase much needed equipment and supplies for hazardous material mitigation efforts. Uh, the fire department still uh, operates a regional hazardous materials response team. Uh, in the fall, uh, we celebrated 25 years of service to the citizens of College Station and the surrounding communities. That was back in 95. In 96, Station 4 opened at Easterwood Airport. This is a little different kind of facility. It was built by the university and the operations and maintenance costs are shared by College Station Fire Department and the university. Uh, the fire department provides ARF, which is aircraft rescue and firefighting service under contract uh, to Eastwood Airport, and we also staff an engine out of Station 4. In 2006, October 2006, College Station Fire Department opened up their fifth fire station. Uh, rapid growth in the area, uh, rapid population growth, uh, rapid growth in the university, the number of students, uh, the number of students is not only a major factor in our population, uh, we're seeing more and more people moving back to this area to retire. Uh, this is a, a nice area to retire. It's busy, but not too busy. It's uh, close to Houston, close to Austin, not too far from uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, not too far from San Antonio. Uh, it offers a whole lot, and we're seeing people that are recognizing that and moving back into the community. Uh, this means an increased need for services. So in 2006, Station 5 was opened up. Once Station 5 was opened, and there's a better shot of Station 5, once Station 5 was opened, we were able to uh, relocate Station 3. Uh, like I said, at, at, uh, at the point that Station 3 was put out on Highway 6 South, it was pretty good to be able to cover both sides. Uh, we were hoping we would be able to move before the access roads went one way. We missed that by about a year. Uh, so Station 6 was moved uh, west of Highway 6, or Station 3 was moved west of Highway 6 on Barron Road. Uh, and the property that, that was Station 3 on Highway 6 South was, was sold to uh, uh, 4-H, uh, who really did a lot of remodeling. That's, that's really a nice, nice facility. I'm glad they were able to, to use that particular piece of property. But Station 3 looks a whole lot like Station 5. Um, we found a, a design and a footprint and a layout that worked very, very well for a fire station. And it was pretty easy to, uh, like the architects say, adapt the color palette uh, to fit in with, with whatever neighborhood it was in. Uh, since, we, since it was a very functional design, uh, very cost effective, uh, we found ways to make it very durable. Uh, Three and five look an awful lot alike. I would bet that probably station seven and eight, when they come online, will look a lot like it too. It's a good functional design. And in December of 2012, we opened fire station six. Uh, fire station six is at the corner of, of Taro and University Drive. The, uh, we had known for a long time we needed a station in that area. Uh, infill development just kept going and going and going. Uh, we were fortunate in that we anticipated the type of development that was going to be going on on University Drive. Uh, at, I don't know if you've noticed at the corner of, of uh, Texas and University, they're building a, a little project there. Uh, uh, the rise on University Drive, 17 floors, the stack behind that, uh, five stories. Uh, where uh, off of, of College Avenue, uh, there's a, well, it's not Campus Point, but there's a big uh, development going in, student housing and things like that. 
uh, where married student housing had been on campus. That will be the Campus Point project. That's going to be about a $200 million project when it's completed. Uh, so the need for Station 6 on that end of town uh, was very evident and, and we were able to, to get it in there about the right time. Uh, so so in, the, in the short history of the College Station, City of College Station Fire Department, uh, about 41 years, uh, we've gone from uh, one firefighter at one station to flip the slide. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 to 100, 120 firefighters uh, on three shifts, uh, 40 per shift. Uh, at six stations staffing six engines, four ambulances, a ladder truck, an aircraft rescue and firefighting vehicle out at the airport, a 3,000 gallon tanker uh, to supplement water supply in those areas of the city that the uh, city does not supply the water for, a wildland firefighter <coughs> vehicle, a uh, battalion chief shift commander's vehicle. Uh, we also provide uh, beyond fire suppression and EMS, uh, swift water rescue. We have a, a dive rescue and recovery team. And like I said, a regional hazardous materials response team uh, that will respond to Brazos County or any of the surrounding counties when needed. A little quick, but that's okay. Uh, last year's uh, run totals, uh, a little over 7,700 calls for service within the uh, city limits of the City of College Station. And I think the big thing is uh, almost 4,900 of those calls were EMS related. That's why earlier we said uh, taking on the ambulance service was probably the most significant event that has happened uh, in the history of our fire department. Uh, 65 to 70 percent every year uh, the calls we make are related to uh, EMS in one way or another. Uh, uh, one other thing I wanted to tell you, that uh, 7,724 calls uh, represents about a 12.5% increase over the uh, previous year. Uh, as our population uh, keeps getting closer and closer to that 100,000 mark, uh, which I think the last estimate I got was 99,982. <laughs> getting really close. Uh, we expect to see a, a kind of a geometric progression in the number of calls we have. Uh, never a dull moment. Uh, I'm sure you're tired of listening to me. I'm tired of standing here. Uh, no, just kidding. But uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Christina now, and she can talk to you some about uh, fire prevention. And actually, that's that's the the main job of any fire department is to prevent fires, to prevent ourselves out of a job. So we're going to go all the way back to 1608. <coughs> we haven't practiced our slide switching together. There we go. Jamestown was actually the first recorded fire in the early Americas. And as a result of that, there were only 38 people that survived that fire. That was right before John Smith came over with his new set of colonists. It started in the community blockhouse, as it was known at the time. Um, just it was like I said first recorded his uh, recorded fire in the history of the United States um, no significant uh, prevention efforts came from that we started it took us time to try to figure ourselves out as a as a nationwide department to see what was going to happen so next in Boston now we're gonna leave today feeling very sorry for Boston because they had a lot of rough fires in the beginning the first recorded fire that they had was in 1630, and that was caused by, uh, it was Thomas Tharp, and it was his home, and it started in his wooden chimney. And from there, as, as you know, many of the homes were made of wooden chimneys and thatched roofs. As a result of that fire, the city, the city men of Boston declared that it no longer would people be able to build their homes with thatched roofs or wooden chimneys. And that, in essence, was the first fire prevention act of the United States back in 1630. <clears throat> Boston had another fire in 1653, which led to people, uh, they were then required to have, have ladders at their houses so that when the 
bucket brigades got there. They could climb up the ladders to help put out the fires. And then in 1676, that's when we started seeing the first fire pumper, as you will, Bart was saying earlier, that our engines are pulled on wheels, but the very first ones was actually a handheld wooden box that the firefighters took to the fire. The bucket brigades would come and fill the buckets with the water. There was a hose attached to it, and then they could, they could put out the fires from there. So the first true paid fire department was in Boston, and they had 12 firefighters, so 12 men. See, I can say that, I'm a longhorn. Um, <laughs> and so that was an exciting time that was actually purchased from London. And so now that uh, they had had those three fires, they were a little bit better equipped at suppression for any later fires that would happen. These were the three great fires that happened during the 1700s and 1800s. Of course, I call them the three not so great fires. And the reason that I call them the not so great fires is because during this time, the growth of America, of course, was happening and America had other priorities. It did suffer major fires, which I'm gonna to talk to you very briefly about these three, but I'll also explain why as a result of those fires, there weren't necessarily a whole lot of new preventive efforts that happened. So in 1760, that fire was, guess where? Boston. <laughs> and that one, it started in a, oh, where did it, it, it was in a tavern is where it started, burned most of the city. And Boston at the time was very densely populated, had a very windy harbor. It's very easy for, spy, for fires to spread during that time. It was very destructive to the city. The city started getting a little uh, tired and needed some more resources from Mother Britain and actually sent over asking for more equipment and supplies to help fight all these fires. Although they were acknowledged in their request, the request never came. And then over the next few years, we all know what happened with the American Revolution. It, the Great Fire of New Orleans was a little bit after the Revolution, 1788. And that fire was, it occurred on a Good Friday and it, was, it started in a Catholic church. And at the time, people, when there was a fire, you would ring the church bells, and then that would alert the bucket brigades to go out and fight the fire. Well, since it was at the church, the priest at the time uh, no, said that it, since it was Good Friday, that he would not allow the bells to be rung. <laughs> that, therefore, the, the fire department could not get there, and the fire did spread very quickly. It, it, it destroyed very much of very much of New Orleans and the reason I mean I don't know it's the reason I'm just you know looking at the facts and everything that's going on at the time but that was a time of more growth for United for the United States where they were focused on different more states were joining the Union it was it was more of a let's build up the United States rather than focus on how to prevent these because we had our units we had our pumpers so it was just the nature of the beast at the time. And finally, the Great Fire of New York, that was in 1835. <coughs> and that actually was the worst fire in history since the London Fire of 1666. And that fire, they, they got smart here. They actually, it's the first time they fought fire with fire. It might not be the first time, but it's the first big fire that they did that. So they used gunpowder to basically blow up the buildings on Wall Street so that the fire would not be able to spread past that. And that there is a picture of the Great Fire of New York at the time, just to kind of show you. This was the earliest picture that I could find of an actual fire that happened in, in the United States. So moving on into the 1850s, I call this the 50 years of first because this is when we started figuring it out. We didn't have to wait for a fire to happen before we developed ways of preventing them and suppressing them. So in 1852, a, of course, Samuel Morse had just invented the telegraph. And then another gentleman by the name of William Channing thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if I take that idea, develop a metal box, when it's pulled, it transmits a signal to a central office, and then that signal is then transported out to firehouses. So we had the invention of the very first fire alarm box in 1852. In 1874, there was a pianist 
by the name of Henry Parmalee, and not only did he play the piano, but he also built pianos. He knew a thing or two about all the fires that had happened in his part of the world, and he decided that he didn't want, to ha want it to happen in his place of business where he was building his fires. So he developed, he installed metal pipes on his ceiling, and he inserted valves that at 155 degrees would melt and therefore release the water that was in them. And so there you have the very first automatic fire sprinkler. Yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. And then in 1896, a group of um, uh, civic leaders realized all of these things, even though the, the, those, the previous two inventions had happened from the private sector, they realized that we, the United States is, we need to do something about this. So they formed the NFPA, and you can go ahead and flip it one more time. And that is, stands for the Nile, Nile, <laughs> National Fire Protection Agency. And it is basically what they do is they develop consensus codes and standards that are then uh, voted on, and then various departments throughout the United States can choose to adopt them. Just because they set a, sto a, a model code, it doesn't necessarily mean that the local jurisdiction has to follow it, but many of them do, and City of College Station, of course, does. And the very first published fire, um, fire code was actually that, uh, that for the installation of sprinkler systems. So, all right, now that we got our prevention figured out, we started having some more, some more pretty bad fires but we learned from each one of these fires. The Iroquois Theater fire, that one happened in Chicago, and it happened because a, there was a stage light and it was very close to a velvet curtain, caught on fire. Within 15 minutes, the entire theater was engulfed. Within 30 minutes, the building had collapsed. The reason people could not escape that fire was because exits were blocked, exits, the door swung inward, as a result of that fire, 602 people lost their lives. And one of the prevention efforts that came about from it was ordinances where we call what's called panic hardware on doors. And if you look to, at that exit door right over there, there's no thought process. If you need to get out quickly, you just push the metal bar and it'll open outward. <laughs> so that, that was, not a wonderful fire, but we did learn how to prevent many, not it's not gonna prevent a fire, but it's gonna prevent people from getting injured or possibly dying in those fires by being able to escape. <coughs> and then in 1908, we had the Lakeview Elementary School fire that was in Collinwood, Ohio. 157 children unfortunately died in that fire by this time classes <coughs> classrooms were multi-story multi uh multi-compartmentalized and even had students in the attic this fire there were only there are very few uh doors that were located of course on the bottom floor there was only one fire escape which was not enough um and then what happened as a result of that fire was the, when we, we started developing codes and ordinances for educational occupancies. And so schools had to start being uh, submitted for plans reviews to make sure that they were gonna properly protect our children. In 1920, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, this was in New York City. It was in the Ash Building and it was the top three floors, nine, 10, 11, or eight, nine, 10, I can't remember if it was 10 or 11 floors. But this company, they designed clothing. And it was a Saturday, and they were, their boss said, you have to work six days a week instead of five. They were there on that Saturday. The fire started on the bottom of the top three floors where, where they were located. The reason that they could not get out of that fire was because the passageways and corridors were so narrow. The reason they were narrow was because they wanted to make sure that when the ladies who were coming in to make the clothing did not steal anything in their purses on the way out so that they could only get through one by one and so that they could check their purses on their way out. So they didn't have enough time to get out. Uh, also in that fire, there was not a sprinkler system. Remember I said just because the NFPA recommends something doesn't mean that it automatically becomes law where you live. 
So in that fire, I'm trying to remember the number of people that it was, it was low in comparisons to some of the other ones, but it was still very tragic. And as a result of that, the city of New York passed 30 new ordinances to help prevent uh, catastrophes like that in the future. Coconut Grove is, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. It w happened in Boston, of course. <laughs> Anybody going to Boston anytime soon? <laughs> Well, make sure you have a, a, a just carry a fire extinguisher with you wherever you go. <laughs> this fire, uh, people say, some people say it was pyrotechnics that started it. Some people, there's, there's, it's, it's undetermined how it started. But in this one, there were 492 people died because they couldn't get out. And the reason for this one was because of the famous revolving door. And go ahead. And I don't know if you can see that very well. If you've seen the movie <coughs> Elf. And we all have that fascination with the revolving door. It's fun, and we love to go around and around and around, but unfortunately, it doesn't get people out. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> what the fire code did was they recommended that when, when you are exiting the revolving door, there's a certain amount of force, and they lowered the amount of force where when you push on it, the door actually collapses thus allowing more people to escape. So that was what happened as a result of that fire. And then finally, in the 1950s, if you notice before all of these events have led to engineering changes, changes in equipment, changes in how we build buildings, it really wasn't until the 50s, until the, um, until the publishing of America Burning, and it was, the, the America Burning was published by the National Commission of Fire Protection and Control. You can see that it says, among the many measures that can be taken to reduce fire losses, perhaps none is more important than educating people about fire. And Americans must be made aware, made, made aware of the magnitude of fire's toll and its threat to them personally. They must know how to minimize the risk of fire in their daily surroundings. They must know how to cope with fire quickly and effectively once it has started. Public education about fire has been cited as many commission witnesses and others as the single activity with the greatest potential for reducing losses. And as you remember from Bart's uh, presentation, it was about this time into the next 10 to 20 to 30 years where fire departments really started funding their public education departments. Even Richard Nixon approved of the America Burning publication saying that the Commission on Fire Protection and Control has made a good beginning, but it cannot do our work for us. Only people can prevent fires. We must become constantly alert to the threat of fires to ourselves, our children, and our homes. Fire is almost always the result of human carelessness. Each one of us must become aware, not for a single time, but for all the year, of what he or she can do to prevent fires. And okay, so now in today's world, we have what we call the three E's of fire prevention, and that's engineering, enforcement, and education. Enforcement is what happens when people are not doing the things that they are supposed to be doing, and we have to slap them on the hand. And then engineering was everything that we had talked about up until this point regarding how you build buildings, inspectors that go out and make sure, sign off on them, yes, they are built properly. And finally, education, getting out there, teaching people about what causes fires, how to escape from fires, and how to protect yourself from the inherent risk of fire. And one of the ways we do that is our picture, as you see, our Citizens Fire Academy, and that happens every spring. It's about to start up again. We have a recent graduate sitting right over here, Linda Harvell, graduated <laughs> last year. She's in that picture. <laughs> and it's just, it's a wonderful way to teach people not only about the fire department, but how they can protect themselves and their families. So that is fires and prevention over the last few years, starting in 1608. And thank you very much. I guess. We can open it up to, do we have time for questions? Yeah.